Eitan. Good to see you, Eitan. Good to see you, Eitan. Hello. All right. Good to see you, too. You could, you could present. You've read all the chapters in, in great true. depth. That's true. I'm going I'm, I'm to go get a beer and you, you, know, you just take yeah. over from here. <laughs> Are you in Indonesia? I am. I'm in Jogja. You are? Oh, wow. Yeah. Good for you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Keo. Hey there. Oh, hey. Good to, good to see you. How are you? Uh, good, good. I'm doing How well. Are you finishing up? I am. Actually, yeah. I applied for a PhD program at Stanford. You what? I applied for a PhD program at Stanford. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. That's great. I think some departments are taking PhD students, not, not all of them, but um, right. yeah, fortunately. Is Michigan taking PhD students? As far as I know, it's just yeah? business as usual, yeah. Oh, is it? Okay, good. So we've got a, a quorum here, and I think we can get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, whether you are in the Asian morning or whether you are in the North American evening. Uh, thanks for joining this session on Japan and Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm John Chorciari. Most of you know me. I'm the director of our International Policy Center. Uh, and uh, we are co-hosting this event with the Center of Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University in Japan. Thank you very much to Erica Seleski for organizing today's session. And thank you for our two other uh, speakers who are here today. One is uh, my friend and co-author Kyo Tsutsui, who is until recently a, a star faculty member at the University of Michigan, now at Stanford, where he's the uh, Takahashi professor and senior fellow in Japanese studies, also directs the uh, uh, Japan program at the Shorenstein Asia uh, Pacific Research Center, uh, is a senior fellow of the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford, as well as a professor of sociology. Uh, and Keo is also the author of many publications, among them a book called Rights Make Might, Global Human Rights and Minority Social Movements in Japan uh, that's won many awards. I'm also joined by a friend and colleague, Pavin Chachavo Pongpun, who is an associate professor at uh, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Kyoto University, after he got his uh, bachelor's degree at Chula Longkorn and his PhD at London's uh, SOAS. Uh, he was a diplomat in the Thai uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for more than a decade. Uh, now he's been at Kyoto for the better part of the last 10 years, where he's the editor-in-chief of the Kyoto Review of Southeast Asia. He's written widely on Thai foreign policy, as well as Thai domestic politics, and is the editor of a new volume that's coming out soon on the Thai coup and royal succession. Tonight, what we're going to do is uh, I will start off by sharing uh, some of the findings from the uh, collaborative study that's uh, going to be uh, coming to fruition in the form of an edited volume. Uh, Keo will then uh, speak also for about 15 minutes. Uh, Pavin will uh, share some of his comments as discussant, uh, and then we'll leave lots of time for, for your questions and comments. I also want to call out Eitan Paul, who's here, who's a doctoral student at, at UM and a Southeast Asia expert in his own regard, and he has been the managing editor and provide really invaluable contributions to our uh, edited volume as well. And uh, I can't see right now in the participant list, but I know Sean Narine, one of our chapter contributors from St. Thomas University in Canada, uh, uh, also plans to attend. And so we may be able to fold him into the conversation in Q&A. Here's the picture that will be on the cover of our book, uh, an image of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, embodying this idea of Japan as a courteous power. And uh, the collaborative project that uh, Kyo and I undertook wanted to look at this very important and enduring relationship between Japan and Southeast Asia, study its basic dynamics, uh, and look at its prospects going forward. It's not a coincidence that in October, uh, when new Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga came to power in Japan, that the very first trip he took overseas was to Southeast Asia. And you can see images of him uh, uh, in first in uh, Vietnam on the left and then in Indonesia on the right. Again, very much uh, uh, images that capture this notion of Japan as a courteous power, uh, keen to show that Southeast Asia is important to Japan and also to participate uh, uh, in, in some local customs. So this collaborative project joined an interdisciplinary group of scholars from Japan, Southeast Asia, and North America. The Japan Foundation graciously supported this research, uh, and the forthcoming edited volume will be with the University of Michigan Press, and it's called The Courteous Power. 
we cover several key themes in the book. Uh, one of them is to spotlight Japan's proactive and autonomous roles in Southeast Asia in a number of dimensions. It's not uncommon in the United States in particular, but also in other parts of the world, to speak about Southeast Asia as a domain for Sino-American competition uh, and to downplay or even neglect the very important role that Japan has played. It's also common to think of Japan as operating like a U.S. adjunct uh, uh, or a supplement to the U.S. power in the region because of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. But in fact, uh, as our contributors show, uh, Japan has been proactive and quite autonomous from the United States in many dimensions. A second theme we look at is the continuity and change that's occurred over the last eight or so years in what we call the Indo-Pacific era, the era in which Shinzo Abe returned for his second term as prime minister and later pronounced the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific a very bold stroke in Japanese diplomacy. And so we look uh, at uh, the last uh, eight years and observe the areas in which Japan's policy towards Southeast Asia has changed and where it's remained the same. Thirdly, uh, we focus on the importance of non-state actors in Japan's relations with the region. This is another area that we think has gotten real short shrift in the literature, which tends to focus on official relations at the expense of looking at other actors like businesses, civil society, and ordinary people. Lastly, emerging from this analysis is the idea of Japan as a courteous power. It's not a, a title that we started with when we began this project. It's an observation that emerged from the opportunity to, to engage in this collaboration with, uh, with leading scholars uh, from those various regions to see that in so many domains that Japan behaved in a way that we think of as a courteous power. That is to say, a country that has formidable capabilities, but that wears those capabilities lightly, that tends to keep its head down, that uh, prioritizes listening to the preferences, needs, and interests of its Southeast Asian partners, and rather than trying to force their hands, looks for areas of preference alignment to be able to facilitate progress uh, in areas where those interests align. In the book, we, we discuss uh, multiple channels of influence uh, that Japan has in Southeast Asia. Some of those occur through official levels, whether in the security arena, uh, the economic domain, or via diplomacy, uh, and uh, other channels of influence occur uh, through non-state channels, such as businesses, civil society organizations, uh, migrants from Japan to Southeast Asia, including migrant women, who are the subject of one of our chapters, and both producers and consumers of cultural products uh, like manga and anime and the image captured here on the bottom of your slide. So I wanna walk through a few of the chapters that cover official relations uh, between Japan and Southeast Asia. I'll go through those five very briefly to give you a flavor of what's in, in the study. And then Kyo will do the latter five and wrap up with some conclusions. The first of our chapters uh, uh, is one that I authored and it's about Japan as a key to Southeast Asian diversification. Uh, many studies of Southeast Asia nowadays talk about hedging, and in particular, they talk about hedging vis-a-vis -vis a rising China or hedging vis-a-vis -vis the uh, possibility of U.S. withdrawal or abandonment of its friends and allies in the region. Diversification is a little bit different than hedging, although they overlap. And, uh, and this part of our study examines the way in which Japan has via its autonomous activity in Southeast Asia provided an option for those states to diversify, in particular diversify beyond China and the United States and their external relations. Um, and I look at this through several key domains. You look at aid, trade, and investment. Uh, you can see the uh, foreign direct investment and trade figures in these pie charts and the red slices uh, representing Japan are just a quick visual illustration of one way of thinking about Japan's role as a key diversifier. Japan also allows countries to diversify in governance terms to reduce their reliance, for example, on political and economic support from the United States or Europe, which tend to be more critical uh, of governance, uh, and instead to invest in a partner in Japan that has been more accommodating of, of differences on uh, domestic governance approaches. And increasingly, uh, Japan has also become a source of diversification in the security arena, particularly when it regards maritime security affairs around the South China Sea. And that's the subject of our next chapter written by Ken Jimbo, an expert at Keio University in Japan. He looks at how Japan has emerged in the security domain and how it has edged onto the scene, first very inoffensively through peacekeeping operations, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and then 
engaging a little bit more in traditional security affairs, including maritime security, such as Coast Guard patrols, uh, naval operations, and the like. And he describes how Japan has done this through a three-pronged approach. It's built out its security networks with partners, particularly states like Vietnam and the Philippines, but also others. It has contributed through capacity building for Southeast Asian navies, Coast Guards, and other security uh, forces. Uh, and it's engaged robustly in defense diplomacy, particularly through the multilateral channel represented by the ADMM Plus or ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. That's a very wordy uh, phrase that captures a meeting of the defense ministers of the 10 Southeast Asian members of ASEAN plus key external members, including Japan. And the punchline from his study is that Japan has sought to be an increasingly important security actor, but not a provocative one. Uh, and thus in this regard, as in its role as a diversifier, uh, it has uh, uh, conformed to the notion of Japan as a courteous power. Kei Koga from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore uh, wrote our third chapter, and he wanted to ask the question of how Japan and ASEAN can cooperate beyond the geographic confines of Southeast Asia. This is important because the definition of the Indo-Pacific region uh, was one that extended beyond the preceding notion of an Asia-Pacific region to include uh, areas uh, to the west of the Indian subcontinent, extending all the way to the Middle East and East Africa. And so Kay wants to know, is Japan going to be able to forge cooperation with ASEAN in those extended geographic domains? Uh, and his study suggests that it's going to be very difficult. Uh, he looks at something called wedge strategies. Think of driving a wedge between two parties. And he's saying that uh, uh, wedge strategies are an important means by which major powers can drive wedges between ASEAN and their rivals or between ASEAN members themselves, thereby limiting the organization's ability to function. And he uses the example of Japan's role in the 2000s uh, during the creation of the East Asia Summit. The EAS, as it's called, was was uh, initiated as an idea by China and Malaysia as something that would build on the ASEAN plus three framework. That's the framework devised after the Asian financial crisis that included the 10 ASEAN members plus South Korea, plus Japan, plus China. Japan was wary of that initiative because it saw that as a possible vehicle that China could come to dominate and so wanted to include other members that would offset some of China's scope for influence, including Australia, uh, India and to a lesser extent New Zealand. And Japan was instrumental in that case in helping to drive a wedge essentially between ASEAN and China by helping those members of ASEAN uh, that were sympathetic to its views uh, to mobilize in favor of the admission of a larger range of countries. And so while this showed Japan's ability to exercise a wedge strategy itself, it's also an indication uh, that it would be difficult for Japan to drive bold initiatives uh, in cooperation with ASEAN because the same wedge strategies are available to China and others. And this is somewhat of an irony um, that Japan, by investing in ASEAN centrality and on consensus-based diplomacy, has actually imposed limits on itself. And that's an understood feature of Japanese foreign policy in Southeast Asia. It's an intentional feature, um, but it is one that has a certain irony to it. Sean Narine uh, is the author of our next chapter, and he studies uh, the uh, Japanese approach toward ASEAN unity. ASEAN as a diverse grouping of 10 uh, is highly uh, dependent on the unity of its members to address key challenges. A bunch of you on the call were in that South China Sea simulation recently and observed this in practice. Uh, when ASEAN is disunited, it's very tough to take a corporate stance on key issues of concern. Uh, and Sean looks at uh, historical examples of this to show, for example, the importance of ASEAN unity in dealing with uh, the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in the 1980s, uh, and the importance of its disunity uh, in the haphazard response to the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. And he describes how Japan may have incentives uh, to back away from its traditional prioritization of ASEAN unity and centrality uh, when ASEAN is unable to act on issues that it really cares about. So let's take the South China Sea as an example. If ASEAN as a whole is divided uh, and therefore can't make a strong statement on the South China Sea, Japan may have an incentive to form minilateral cooperation with a few members that share its attitudes on the issues such as the Philippines or Vietnam or Indonesia uh, or Singapore. However, he observes what's happened in the Indo-Pacific era 
and finds that while Japan's initial rhetoric was bold, its behavior has actually reverted more toward uh, a, a deference to ASEAN uh, and a continued promotion of ASEAN centrality and unity uh, in the regional order. And thus we see another instance of Japan uh, sort of falling back on its longstanding approach of being a courteous power in the region, not trying too hard to force ASEAN states to, to change their preferences or their direction. And the last of the chapters that I'll, that I'll introduce quickly by Calvin Fung at Waseda University in Tokyo is uh, a study of Japan's approach to regional leadership. He looks at three different historical cases, including uh, uh, the Dakiyama proposal in the early 1990s, which had to do with creating a new security architecture after the Cold War, the creation of the East Asia Summit, and then the introduction of the free and, Indo, free and open Indo-Pacific concept uh, in, in the 2015 to 16 period. And what his studies show uh, uh, in some are that Japan had very limited capacity to actually change Southeast Asian preferences. However, it was quite effective in being able to identify areas where their, where their interests align uh, and thereby to do what President Obama once called leading from behind, that it was able to facilitate common movement towards shared goals, even when it wasn't uh, uh, able through coercion or through inducement to fundamentally reorient uh, the interests of those parties. And so taken together, uh, this, like the other studies, uh, uh, tends to support the image of Japan as a courteous power. I'll turn over now to Kyo, and he can walk through uh, the rest of the study. Wonderful. Thank you, John. And thank you both John and Erica for organizing this session. And thank you to Pavin for joining us. And special thanks to Eitan for all uh, the contribution that he has made. Um, so much so, so that he could easily present uh, the second half of the book uh, better than I would. Um, it's great to be back virtually in Ann Arbor um, and to be connected to Kyoto, to pl uh, two places that I spent years in um, in the past. Um, so the second half of um, the book um, zooms in on um, the contributions by non-governmental actors, uh, businesses, civil society actors, and cultural products, um, their role in establishing Japan as a courteous power. And the second half starts with a chapter by Kiri um, Prasirtisk uh, from Thailand, uh, who provides a nice overview of the business's contributions uh, in the Southeast Asia region um, since the 1960s. And he, um, compartmentalizes the uh, post 1945, post 1960 era for Japan Southeast Asia relations into three parts. In the first part, um, as Japan returned to that region, um, Japan internally had a, a very cozy relationship uh, between the government and business actors. And um, both uh, parties used, you know, they walked in tandem and using um, ODA and FDI to, to first assist economic development and economic growth in Southeast Asia, but also benefiting from the economic activities that resulted from that uh, in the region. Uh, this is a period of um, um, METI, uh, METI really guiding the uh, Japanese economy and trade and k the uh, Japan Federation of Economic Associations, uh, uh, forming a bond between uh, government actors, bureaucrats and politicians and uh, um, uh, corporations. So that was the first period. And, and in the second period, a lot of that continued on, but there were more of uh, efforts to establish multilateral frameworks to facilitate business transactions in the region. That, that's the 1990s to 2000s. Uh, this is when Pan-Asia supply chains expanded and there was a more of a need to coordinate and also to establish more of a free uh, movement of uh, uh, the goods and capital. So the, uh, the Japanese government, uh, or Japan in general, uh, moved in that direction um, using the Asian Development Bank, which already existed, but also trying to establish a new institution like uh, the Asian Monetary Fund, which uh, didn't pan out, but uh, uh, the Japanese uh, actors came back and tried to do other things like Miyazawa Initiative, Chenmai Initiative, uh, contributing to a more of a free trade uh, of uh, free flows of goods and capital in the region. Um, that those efforts form the basis for uh, more efforts on free trade agreements, which um, um, came to fruition uh, to a certain extent in recent years and really months. 
that was the phase two. And then the, in the third era, uh, since the 2010s, the nature of uh, uh, the engagement between Japan and Southeast Asia changed a little bit, but also the, uh, the nature of government business uh, ties have uh, shifted in this era. So the Japanese government started focusing more on security areas. Uh, Southeast Asia was primarily uh, for the Japanese government an area of uh, region of economic activity. But now with the rise of China and Japan's um, increasing realization that it needs to counter with a concerted effort with Southeast Asian countries, um, the government is now focused uh, uh, as much on security areas uh, as in economic areas. So that, that really changed the government's engagement. And, and uh, simultaneously, um, the uh, businesses that enter the Southeast Asia market which was which were really heavily uh, um, oriented toward um, uh, industries, heavy industries in particular, and manufacturing. Now there's a lot more service sector businesses, retails, restaurants, and health. Uh, those uh, um, industries, those are uh, economic actors are going in the in the market in that region, and that um, and they tend to be more um, smaller, independent. Uh, independent from the government and they're less connected to uh, bureaucracy in the Japanese government. Um, so that leads to less of a concerted effort between the government and businesses in engaging with Southeast Asia. So the nature of the engagement changed. Having said that, uh, the government is, Japanese government is still attentive to businesses needs promoting um, regional integration efforts like um, in CPTPP and recently RCEP. Um, and also in more of a case-by-case -case sort of uh, um, engagement with South, Southeast Asian countries, um, as demonstrated very vividly in the next chapter, uh, which is, um, um, John, if you can move to the next chapter, uh, an example of uh, Thailand and, and the coup in 2014 and, and um, how the businesses, Japanese businesses, um, facilitated uh, the that, that process of transition in that country. So in, um, uh, on, on May 22nd of 2014, uh, the army commander, uh, Prayas Chan Ocha, seized power. And um, quickly the US government criticized the move uh, on the grounds of you know, democracy and freedom. And uh, the Japanese government was put in a, a difficult position. Uh, the Jap Japan had to say something critical to go along with the US uh, ideology of democracy and freedom, but at the same time, the Japanese government wanted to maintain a good relationship with, with the Thai regime, uh, even if it's a military coup. Um, so that um, pre presented a, a serious dilemma for the Japanese government. And that's when the Japanese businesses at the Japanese Chamber of Commerce in Bangkok uh, stepped in and provided a, a, a one of the very few channels of communication uh, between the Japanese government and the Thai military officers who took over in the country and um, really helped navigate uh, the Japanese government, navigate the, uh, this territorial train. So what the um, Japanese Chamber of Commerce did basically is to reframe the idea of democracy in such a way that um, the Japanese government can um, criti criticize or at least push um, uh, the, the Thai regime to become more democratic um, to satisfy the U.S.'s uh, uh, demand for the Japanese, not demand, but uh, pressure to um, criticize for the, on the Japanese government to criticize the new Thai military regime, but also not to alienate, completely alienate the Thai military officers who took over. Uh, and the way they did it is to change the um, content of democracy from uh, this, uh, you know, more standard understanding, or at least American understanding of civil liberties uh, and freedom type of uh, focus to uh, focus on transparency and, and political stability, which would contribute to economic uh, um, prosperity as well. So by shifting the democracy, reframing the democracy in that way, the Japanese government could tell the Thai government, Thai regime, that, uh, oh, you have to become more democratic. But you know, what we mean by that is to become more transparent and provide more stability. And to the U.S. government, the Japanese government could tell, could, could say that, oh, we're, we're pressuring the, uh, we're pressing the, the new Thai regime to become more democratic. And the U.S. government would think that democ democratic democracy here means 
civil liberty. Right? So that um, uh, process demonstrates how effective uh, the Japanese businesses, Japanese Chamber of Commerce were in, um, in um, linking the, the Japanese government and the Thai new regime. Uh, the next two chapters focus on civil society actors and their contributions. Um, the uh, first one, the third one that I present uh, is by Siripon uh, Wajwak, uh, who looks at the um, NGOs, Japanese NGOs in Southeast Asia, uh, especially in the Meccan uh, region. Um, NGOs, NGO actors who contribute to the uh, development aid. And um, the role of NGOs has expanded uh, global, globally, uh, the role of NGOs in um, aid delivery, uh, project implementation, and so on. Uh, and Japan um, um, caught that wave. And since the mid 1990s, the Japanese government also started using, uh, getting help from NGOs more to uh, provide aid, uh, aid more effectively in Southeast Asia. Um, and that was helpful in many ways, but also uh, presented a a, a challenge for some NGOs, because if they work um, too closely with the Japanese government, uh, they might actually lose sight of the um, interest of the local community. Right? Um, but if they don't work with the Japanese government and focus on representing local interests, then they may not have a lot of impact on the actual policy making uh, in, in the Japanese government. So she presents uh, two contrasting cases. One is Mekong Watch, the other is Japan Water Forum. Uh, both work in um, development in, in the Mekong region. And the first uh, NGO, Mekong Watch, works very uh, closely to local communities trying to represent local interests and decided at some point to not uh, work with the Japanese government. Um, so they're more effective in presenting to the Japanese public um, what would be the best way to deliver aid in that region that would contribute to sustainable development. Uh, without uh, forced relocation or economic, uh, environmental degradation. Um, but the back, uh, but the, uh, the other side of that coin is that uh, Mekong Watch doesn't really have any well, very limited impact, direct impact on the policy making in the Japanese government in terms of aid. The second group, NGO Japan Water Forum, uh, works closely with the Japanese government. So uh, the group has uh, some significant impact on the policy making. The government will would listen to the uh, uh, group, but uh, whether they th that group uh, represents the interest of local communities, need and interest is questionable. Um, they might not necessarily uh, represent local interests. So uh, she really um, uh, very um, nicely captured the dilemma that the, the two types of NGOs face in the uh, uh, aid development. The next chapter, by uh, Len Lin Fang and Mika Toyota. They look at um, uh, uh, Japanese women and their contributions to um, contributions in um, engaging with Southeast Asia. So they focus on, um, um, well, I mean, when we think about Japanese people living in Southeast Asia, um, the, the typical image that's invoked is um, Japanese expats corporate workers, mostly male corporate workers with their trailing family members, uh, living comfortably in enclaves with very limited interaction with local people. That was a typical image. Uh, that may still be true for the most part, but since the mid 1990s, um, uh, many more female Japanese migrants uh, moved to Southeast Asia, settled in there um, semi-permanently, uh, not just visiting there. And, and they have changed the way um, Japanese citizens interact and engage with Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so those women um, were, uh, many of them were um, not too happy with the Japanese uh, work environment uh, with uh, a very low glass ceiling. And um, all those things may have been changing in the last five, 10 years. Um, at the time in the 1990s, uh, um, Japanese corporate world was uh, very much dominated by uh, men, and they um, they didn't have a bright, uh, they didn't perceive a bright future in Japan. In Japan, so they left. Uh, it did not. It didn't help that um, the last twenty years of uh, uh, post bubble Japanese economy um, deprived uh, the employment opportunities for a lot of newly graduating uh, Japanese female uh, students. 
so many women uh, first went to uh, Western countries and then gradually they also uh, started going to Southeast Asia. And uh, they go to Southeast Asian countries. This is a very diverse group. They go to Southeast Asian countries for different reasons and, and work in different areas. Some of them uh, work as uh, local hires at Japanese corporations and others teach, teach Japanese language. Others own uh, small businesses or engage in volunteer and uh, philanthropic kind of activities. Um, and still others marry into local communities, marrying a local um, um, citizens in those countries. Um, and many of them go there. Um, I, I, uh, they don't think that a lot of uh, those women go there thinking that they will uh, uh, be um, uh, citizen diplomats going in there promoting the gospel of how great Japan is and that kind of stuff. And that's not, that wasn't their motivation. They go there um, really sort of uh, as a result of self-searching, uh, uh, identity kind of searching that became also popular in Japan since the 1990s. Um, but they end up um, really building strong uh, bonds between Japan and Southeast Asia. As they engage with local communities and um, build a, uh, um, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them are uh, great citizens of the local communities, contribute to local efforts and uh, contribute to good image of Japan as a courteous nation. Uh, they also bring back some of the knowledge of uh, uh, Southeast Asia to Japan, try to promote understanding about Southeast Asian countries in Japan by publishing books and you know, doing other kinds of promotional activities. Um, so they are not uh, assisted strongly by the government or even corporate actors, but they go on their own and um, um, help contribute to um, Japan and Southeast Asia engagement. The next chapter by Carl Chan Chua um, looks at uh, Japan's soft power in the region. Um, and uh, the chapter starts off with uh, uh, some evidence um, of how manga and anime are the most uh, potent uh, source of Japan's soft power uh, in Southeast Asia, probably globally. And, um, but it's, it's interesting to think about Japan's soft power uh, popular culture in Southeast Asia because there was this uh, phenomenon of Oshin a very popular TV show that uh, became a huge hit in many Southeast Asian countries, uh, as well as in other countries in the world. Um, that was in the, in the 80s to maybe early 90s for the most part. Um, then the recent effort by the Japanese government uh, um, under the heading of the Cool Japan Initiative by METI, um, that started in, in the 2010s. Um, but by then, the Japanese uh, popular culture was already fairly popular in Southeast Asia. So why is that? And Carl argues that um, for the most part, uh, those efforts to um, initiatives to promote Japanese popular culture were taken on by local uh, citizens of Southeast Asia who, who just liked Japanese popular culture, especially anime and manga. And um, um, promoted uh, related activities. Um, you know, without um, maybe the authentic uh, framework understanding of Japanese of, uh, uh, popular culture, nor um, sometimes uh, a proper legitimate legal license to, to do so. So he talks about three e examples uh, of uh, local adaptation and unlicensed sort of distribution of Japanese soft power. First one is hijab cosplay, which is an Indonesian version of uh, sort of Muslim adaptation of cosplay, cosplay, costume play is um, um, you know, getting into a character by um, um, wearing costumes of uh, popular uh, manga and anime characters. And, and this hijab cosplay is a very unique uh, Indonesian version of this uh, practice that does not exist in Japan, um, but it, it became very popular as a local adaptation. So this is kind of dis different from authentic Japanese popular culture, but um, uh, was a, a was interpreted as a Japanese uh, culture. Uh, the second example is a Duterte manga anime in the Philippines, uh, which is a Japanese style, but, but non-authentic uh, depiction of Duterte, President Duterte in, in cartoons, in manga anime style uh, depiction, which is uh, uh, really nothing to do with Japanese uh, authors of uh, uh, manga anime. Uh, but also uh, brought with it some Japanese cultural cachet and helped uh, um, 
sort of bring up the level of uh, popularity of Japanese manga anime. The third example is Doraemon Tofu. Uh, it's a, Doraemon is a popular character in Japan, in, in Asia. Um, and it became popular in Vietnam. He focuses on the, on the Vietnam example. It became popular without um, licensed distribution of the manga uh, for the most part for decades. Uh, Doraemon was read in Vietnam uh, through a pirated version. Uh, and it became popular. Um, and then as a result, uh, some products like Draymond Tofu, uh, which is a more legitimate use of the uh, uh, copyrighted um, image of Draymond, uh, that came much later. Um, so the popularity of Draymond having been established earlier through unlicensed consumption of the manga was a very important component. And what's interesting about this is that the Japanese, the author, Fujiko Fujio, uh, didn't try to uh, get get the money uh, copyright uh, uh, royalties uh, from that uh, un unlicensed consumption and just basically forgave that all of all of that, uh, just enjoying uh, the popularity of Draymond and they didn't try to benefit from that. That's another kind of interesting uh, sort of courteous approach uh, of a Japanese, and not the government, civil side actors, uh, but um, courteous Japan uh, was sort of exemplified in this example. Uh, and, it, and through this process, it was really not the government or even corporate actors that uh, spread uh, Japanese popular culture in the region. It's the citizens, citizen, citizen to citizen sort of inaction that helped promote manga and anime. Um, so to wrap up quickly, um, this uh, Kurdish approach of uh, Japan, uh, which offers a, a guiding hand, but never really a threatening fist. Um, uh, really nudging Southeast, you know, Japan has its own interests. So Japan always tries to nudge Southeast Asian countries in certain direction that would meet their, uh, meet Japan's interests, but rarely really uh, are forcing um, its hands and or use or even suggest to use coercive measures. Even during the height of its economic might in the 1980s, Japan's approach was typically that. Um, and this was uh, born out of necessity, at least initially, uh, with Japan's uh, image uh, being more of an invaders, uh, you know, because of the uh, World War II era legacy. Um, and Japan was very mindful of that. Um, and, and Japan had to recover from that bad image. So initially that was the main thing. And that, that's uh, one reason why Japan took this approach. But that, that really um, um, helped um, establish Japan as a, uh, in a very advantageous position. Um, Japan is mostly, um, I don't want to overplay this, but, but if, if you look at a lot of surveys, Japan is uh, uh, broadly speaking, the most, uh, one of the most popular countries in um, Southeast Asia. Uh, so this generally popular uh, sort of status and also mostly trusted uh, as a reliable partner uh, by many uh, Southeast Asian governments that resulted from this approach. So that's a, a very important asset. Um, I'll go over the second and third point quickly. So going forward, um, Japan uh, under Suga administration, which continues the, this uh, free and open in the Pacific framework vision uh, and, and Southeast Asian countries, it, uh, they are a very, very important component of that vision. So Japan will likely um, need Southeast Asian countries um, and, and will continue to engage with them, uh, fully understanding that uh, ASEAN centrality is very important for ASEAN countries. Uh, so Japan will continue to engage in a relatively low key and, and largely multilateral approach and work with ASEAN to um, find a convergence of interest uh, between ASEAN countries and Japan. And, and ASEAN countries on the other hand also will likely welcome Japan's engagement um, as an alternative to this uh, US-China dichotomy that they don't wanna get stuck in. Uh, Japan, uh, as John summarized, offers an, a very useful alternative for them. Um, there are some downsides to uh, this courteous approach, obviously. Uh, one is that um, um, in terms of, uh, you know, promoting democracy and human rights and so on, Japan really takes a, a, a sort of backs, uh, takes a step back on that, uh, you know, especially compared to countries like the United States and some European countries, Western European countries. Um, Japan generally avoids uh, interfering with uh, quote unquote domestic affairs, uh, most uh, vividly um, uh, 
um, described in the discussion about how um, uh, Myanmar, right? In Myanmar, uh, Japan really uh, rarely criticized the Myanmar military regime harshly. Uh, and today with Rohingya also, Japan is very careful not to criticize Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, so that, that's a, a one major limitation of uh, uh, being a coalist power. Um, and also looking forward, a second limitation, potential limitation is we don't know what might happen if Japan has, has to ask Southeast Asian countries to take its side. Uh, how much of this uh, uh, popularity and trusted status, how much of that is that it translates into actual support for Japan when it actually comes to some kind of confrontation between Japan and China. That's, that's to be seen and, and somewhat questionable. Um, and finally, so those are limitations of the Korea's power. And finally, we also want to highlight, especially in the second part of the book, how important businesses, civil society actors, NGOs, individual citizens, and also cultural products, how important those are non-state um, um, sources are to um, build a, a lasting tie between Japan and Southeast Asian countries. So um, I'll stop here and um, looking forward to your comments and questions. Great, thank you, Pavan. We look forward to uh, to your comments. Thank you so much, John. So. Uh... First, I'm very delighted to be a part of this uh, event. And I think it's very important uh, to have at least a voice from Southeast Asia. And I'm glad that uh, I am that person to represent uh, what I call a perspective uh, from Southeast Asia, since we have one American and also one Japanese, you know. Uh, yeah, I have done some work on Japan and Southeast Asia and also Japan and Thailand too in the past few years. Uh, so when John asked me to do this, so I, I'm glad to also uh, not only to give some comments, but also to share my own findings uh, on this uh, study of uh, Japan vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia. I usually begin with uh, 1977 with the Fukuda Doctrine when it comes to understanding Japanese foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia, because I think that is the first, uh, how to say, landmark you know, or cornerstone of Japanese foreign policy towards Southeast Asia. Uh, but then I left very disappointed, to be honest. Uh, because it, start, it started off really well with 1997 Fukuda Doctrine when Japan uh, want to engage so much with Southeast Asia, uh, promoting this sort of equality you know, in uh, bilateral relationship and also in relationship with ASEAN as well. When I said I, I, was, I was left disappointed because uh, soon after 1997, uh, what you have seen in Japanese foreign policy, uh, yes, definitely there is some kind of amicable relationship between Japan and, and Southeast Asia. But I have seen it, it's just only being friendly, but there's nothing really strategic coming out from Japan. So it, there is a different you know, idea of being a friendly neighbor and being strategic neighbor. But I think Japan has lagged behind uh, some other country when it comes to crafting strategic position with Southeast with Asia. But then I understand though, because uh, after 1997 or in the middle of, of Cold War, Japan also had its own problem as well, not to mention the Korean Peninsula, not to mention its own problem with China, territorial dispute, right? It complication with uh, the American relationship and also including Japan's internal development because Japan had worked so hard in terms of uh, uh, developing its own economy so as it could because it, it concentrates so much on on the economic development because it 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 became it became something that would compensate to the lack of military uh, uh, capability of Japan in Southeast Asia. So because of that, I started to see uh, Japan even though having good relationship but yet again drifting away, from Southeast Asia. Yes, you talk about uh, regular investment from Japan, you're talking about ODA from Japan, but I have seen this as a kind of routine job for Japan. Once again, I don't, I don't think there is anything a strategic back then. I don't see that how Japan would want to use economic uh, position and also the power of ODA to try to change the behavior of certain Southeast Asian states. Now, move forward to let's say in the past decade, we have this event of the rise of China. This is the second argument. Uh, 
I think because of the rise of China, we started to see Japan renew diplomatic active activism. So that when you started to see Japan becoming a little bit more strategic. But again, <laughs> I have been uh, I have been left disappointed because Japan would only come to Japan would only come to to be activist to be sort of uh, to go ahead with this diplomatic activism. Basically, it was a response to the rise of China. This is in my opinion, maybe not so much so uh, about the importance of Southeast Asia on its own. So in other words, Japan would only come back to the region in order to, to try to counterbalance balance the rise of China. Uh, this also a part of uh, the new uh, post-Cold War uh, international order when you talk about multi polarity that Japan seems sort of obliged you know, to play a role uh, because this is no longer about you know, the democratic camp, the, 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 uh, the, com the communist camp. So yes, I think because of that, Japan started to, to engage more with Southeast Asia. But in my own study though, especially uh, looking at the competition between Japan and China vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN, uh, I don't have all the details here, but it is in, in my book. Uh, but I can prove to you that uh, you continue to see that Japan has lagged behind China in almost every aspect when it comes to, again, the engagement with Southeast Asia. And always Japan would walk a step behind. For example, uh, when China came up with the FTA with ASEAN in 2002 through the uh, ASEAN-China uh, Free Trade Agreement in 2002, Japan would already respond to it in 2008 with uh, ASEAN-Japan uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership. But the list, you know, slowly go on. Uh, you're talking about, uh, uh, for example, uh, cultural cooperation. Then you also see that China would really go ahead and then and then Japan would only, you know, step behind, even to the point that Lee Kuan Yew once said that, you know, what Japan has been good at is following, you know, in the footsteps of China. So, uh, but, but I see, you know, that Japan has tried hard, you know, at least to catching up, uh, to catch up with what uh, China has done with Southeast Asia, and then start to think more strategically, especially Japan could no longer focus on the, the economy alone. Maybe Japan had to expand, you know, uh, into more dimensions when it comes to relationship with Southeast Asia. For example, uh, in the defense area, something like that. Uh, defense area is very important. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm an expert to talk about it, but uh, but in again in my own uh, uh, research, I think Japan. Uh, keep a watchful eye on what really going on in Southeast Asia, uh, especially uh, the, the defense uh, relationship between China and Southeast Asia and including China and individual country in Southeast Asia. For example, you know, Cobra Go, Cobra Go is the, is the annual military exercise between Thailand and United States. But this day is no longer about Thailand and United States, but it's sort of expanded to include any other Southeast Asian state. Uh, then Japan, sorry, then China uh, sort of borrow a kind of model in order to come up with similar thing, but a smaller scale military exercise between China and, and Thailand. And I think that already uh, sort of alarm uh, both, both United States and also Japan too. Uh, this is something that China uh, think carefully. And uh, because of that, uh, in 2012, uh, Jinso Abe came up with people might like to, might like to call uh, Abe doctrine. <laughs> I really don't know what it means. Uh, well, Abe came, uh, came up in 2012, you know, trying to become more assertive you know, in its foreign policy towards East Asia, especially talking more about uh, the military cooperation. I think Japan uh, sort of live on the, the good image that uh, we have mentioned about the, the image of, Ch of Japan as a country, you know, in the eyes of Southeast Asia. And again, there has been some research work on comparing the image of the Japanese and the Chinese among 
Southeast Asia. Undoubtedly, of course, you know, Japan ranked really high, not just only above China, but also above any other country in the region. For example, in comparing with uh, the South Korean, also Japan have been uh, trusted, you know, by Southeast Asian neighbor. And I think Japan tried to use that, you know, as a basis for uh, assertive policy. You started to see from 2012, more regular bilateral visits, you know, exchange between Japan and Southeast Asia. In particular, and I think this is my own observation, Japan uh, started to go to uh, not so obvious country in Southeast Asia. When you talk about South, uh, when you talk about obvious Southeast Asian country, you think about Indonesia, you think about Thailand. Uh, but then more visit started to see, you know, uh, in Vietnam, you know, in Myanmar, especially after the, the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, and there's a lot of, of, of things going on after that. Uh, yes, the increase is in bilateral, bilateral visit and also uh, more aggressive in using aid, ODA and trade as a kind of uh, diplomatic tools. Uh, again, in my own studies, China might have, might have pledged a lot of money going into Southeast Asia, but the actual money that has been delivered to Southeast Asia, Japan has still uh, done it the best, way ahead of China. So you have to, to see the difference between whatever has been pledged and whatever has been actually delivered. We still can count on Japan rather than China. And, and because of that, I think I started to see also that Japan uh, seriously use uh, foreign aid, you know, to expand not just only political influence, but also to expand more businesses uh, coming to Southeast Asia. Uh, just a little bit more on the competition with with uh, China, and uh, and you start to see every single step. Japan start to think carefully to about how to counter certain ideas, policy of China towards Southeast Asia. For example, when the, the Belt and Road Initiative and also the AIIB uh, initiative coming up, Japan responded by raising the amount of FDA uh, from Japan to Southeast Asia into becoming sort of increasing twofold, uh, into becoming something like 20 billion US dollars uh, for FDA uh, to Southeast Asia, starting to engage into other important projects for Southeast Asia, especially high-speed train. This is something that maybe we can talk about during the Q&A. Uh, I mean, in my own country, I know definitely that there is a fierce competition between China and Japan uh, when it comes to the investment into high-speed. Uh, Thailand desperately needs high-speed uh, train project. And then uh, eventually, I think, again, Japan has lost out because Thailand just signed uh, a, a, a deal with China to build uh, this one rail, you know, from uh, Bangkok to connect with uh, the northern, the northeastern part of Thailand, uh, that has already been concluded, and then it will start operating uh, in uh, 2023. I still have not heard that Japan has uh, finalized any deal with Thailand. So I think Japan still have to keep up. But I think Japan did think about it. You know, especially when the TPP, the Trans uh, Partnership Pacific Partnership, uh, seemed not to work out so well under Trump administration. So Japan instead turned to uh, the ASEAN based Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, by trying to link uh, the ASEAN uh, past three ASEAN past six, you know, in the framework of East Asia Summit, you know, into becoming something that Japan could take a lead you know, in order to counter uh, China BRI and uh, and AIB, something like that, and also to compensate on the, uh, the, the, the TPP as well. Uh, the defense. This is something that I'm, in, I'm, I'm very interested and I hope uh, to learn more you know, from this discussion as well. Because uh, sitting here in Japan, uh, people talk so much about how far Japan could go when it comes to uh, engaging uh, with Southeast Asia in the military area. Uh, given the fact that the, the constitution of Japan sort of stand in a way. But I think Japan has done really well, you know, in this regard, uh, starting off with, you know, just basically stick to humanitarian uh, activities. And you have seen uh, Japan uh, being really assertive in that 
uh, doing a kind of joint uh, uh, drill exercise, you know, with the Philippines, with Cambodia, with Vietnam, and I think these countries they are meaningful because because it's happened that all of these seem to take place within the vicinity of the South China Sea. You know, somehow you cannot run away from the I mean, from the suspect. You know, on the part of China. Uh, whether you know China would see this Japan uh, policy uh, or ambition, in fact, uh, as a way to counter uh, China's influence in South China Sea, and in particular uh, those ASEAN claimants that have been you know uh, in dispute with China for the South China Sea territorial dispute, including uh, Vietnam and the, and the Philippines in this case. Japan has done uh, some sort of uh, joint patrol, anti-pirate, for example. Once again, still stick to this kind of non-traditional military exercise, right? Uh, so as not to, not to be perceived as uh, being politically or military ambitious. So as to fit in with the theme of courteous, you know, power. The other thing uh, is I like to learn more as well about Quad. I'm not sure that we have, whether we have, have been talking about Quad, uh, which started in 2017. Uh, I, think, I think in many ways, Quad seemed to fit in with the, the Indo-Pacific strategy of, of, uh, of Japan in terms of, you know, we're talking about promoting free and open uh, region, linking Pacific and the subcontinent of India, right? Uh, I have not done really serious study on Quad, but what I have heard is that maybe India and Australia might not be that keen because, uh, because at the end of the day, they still have to think so much about their, their own relationship with China. And they, I think they become aware that by being with Japan, through court that could be perceived as gank, ganking up, you know, against China. So I think that could be a main obstacle for court. And also from the viewpoint of ASEAN, ASEAN must have been, you know, aware as well that whether if court would become too successful, could that, could that dilute, you know, the, the strengthality of ASEAN as well. And we know that ASEAN is very jealous of its own uh, position here as sort of the driving force for Southeast Asia. And because of that, uh, maybe, you know, uh, it could jeopardize ASEAN support for court. And coming back, go, uh, going back to China as well, whether this could be perceived as uh, too much of an anti-Chinese initiative coming out of Japan. Uh, I think that really my my uh, intervention for now, but I just leave a few points for further discussion, if uh, that would be possible. Uh, we did talk about political role of Japan in Southeast Asia, and I like to see it more. And I think this somehow linked to what happened in Thailand, my own country, and even linked to my own uh, situation in Japan too, being a refugee from uh, the Thai regime. Uh, I think Japan has become too concerned about its economic interests uh, to the point that uh, to the point that it it compromised with its own political standing. After the coup, you know, I had done even until now, you know, some uh, interview with big businesses investing in Thailand. You know what they told me that they're quite happy that there, there was a coup in Thailand because. Whatever happened before the coup under the Yin Lak administration, if you remember the big flood in Thailand in, uh, in 2011, and it hit so badly uh, Japanese car industry in Thailand. And the Thai political, the Thai, the Thai flood became political flood. And I think Jap Japanese businesses uh, became frustrated that, that uh, there seemed to be no one to protect the interests of uh, the business interests of Japan. So that's why when the coup took place, Japan sort of, you know, thinking, uh, uh, deeply that, okay, maybe this, this might be a good thing that from now on, it would only be one stop service for them in contacting with the government. So I think that had been some sort of perception of businesses. So not necessarily really, you know, uh, positive toward uh, political development in Thailand. I was very disappointed that 
at the height of the sanction against the Thai regime after 2014, Japan was the only country in the G8 group to welcome Prayut Chan Ocha. You know, any other country boycott the visit. You know, from the top uh, top elites in the junta, but Japan rolled the red carpet. And in that trip uh, to Tokyo, of Prayut, uh, obviously talking about possibility of high speed deal. Uh, but you even took a Shinkansen, you know, from Tokyo to Osaka in order to try the Shinkansen. That hopefully that would lead to the, lead to the conclusion of a deal. Uh, Deputy Chief of mission of, of mission of the embassy in Japan, I mean the, the, the Japanese embassy in Bangkok, the deep deputy chief of that mission came to talk to me. And then uh, he said that, well, you know, we know, we understand what's going on in Thailand and we really seem feel sympathetic toward uh, pro-democracy movement. But yet at the same time, I hope you understand that we have business to conduct. And, I, I, and, and that person also told me quite frankly that we really want to, uh, to strengthen our partnership with the military. And you must understand that this is something that we have to do. So, I mean, I appreciate uh, his, his frankness. But then that goes to show that, uh, I mean, to be honest, to try to understand Japanese policy toward Thailand and Southeast Asia as a whole, maybe we have to wait, you know, so many different aspects. And also this uh, applicable to the case of Myanmar and the Philippines too. We have heard before that uh, Japan has been very careful not to criticize so much of what's going on in Myanmar with the, with the Tatmadaw and also with the Rohingya thing. We have not heard anything from Japan talking about Duterte, about the extrajudicial killings there, about the, the way that they deal with drug trafficking and also cyber crime right now. That is a political issue that I would like to discuss later. Second point, and hope, hopefully would be my last point, cultural product from Japan. Well, I know Carl really well because I work so closely with Carl. You know, he helped me with a Kyoto review in one issue on manga in Southeast Asia. Well, I still think Japan continue to lag behind. I, I, I don't think focusing on manga as the entry to come back to Southeast Asia, that would be enough. And I talk, I talk this, I, I talk about this, you know, because I see how South Korea right now invading Southeast Asia, you know, South, South Korea came with the Korean wave, you know, a decade ago, and it, it seemed to sort of fade away. But the second wave of the Korean come back and it, it, it come back even more aggressive than, than, Jap than the Japanese and than the Chinese. You know, among Southeast Asia, now we look at, we look, look at South Korea as a source of uh, cultural inspiration, as a kind of huge and popular uh, K-pop, something that becomes so much more superior than J-pop. Nobody listens to J-pop this day. Uh, talking about food and cuisine, Japan become a little bit like, Oh yeah, we can buy sushi anywhere. But we talk about you know Korean beef. We're talking about uh bulgogi, something that is quite trendy, you know. Uh, and and amazingly, not just only South Korea, but it's also come from North Korea too, because the most successful restaurant business in Southeast Southeast Asia come from North Korea, not from South Korea. And that is something about North Korea that has been so intriguing among Southeast Asia that they want to try, and they like to do you know one they serve the food, they like to wear that hanbok thing and dance around in the in, in, in the restaurant. I mean, that is so funny. Uh, uh, last thing, cosmetic and surgery, this kind of thing. You might think that this is trivial business, but this is very edging, uh, cutting edge, you know, business coming from South, South Korea. That has become a part of the cultural invasion. That has sort of eclipsed, you know, what uh, Japan has done uh, in the past. Uh, I wish that Japan would reconsider its cultural uh, position, including the engagement of NGO. This is the last point in your presentation. Uh, I will end by saying that last week I was invited by Osaka University to talk about uh, Milti Alliance. Milti Alliance is the, the alliance between Thailand, Hong Kong, and Taiwan when it comes to uh, giving support uh, to each other's democratic movement, right? We so also link up with Joshua Wong uh, and also uh, 
big uh, activists, you know, in in Taiwan. And this uh, this symposium was organized by Osaka University plus other NGO groups in Japan. This is something. This is the first time that I was invited to this kind of conference. And I must say that among NGO civil society organizations in Japan, they are really keen to know more about political development in Southeast Asia. But but they also admit that the government doesn't seem to open the way for them. So I think this could be something that we could explore how the Japanese government would would set itself as its example when it comes to uh, to look into political development, to following it up, and also to have a, 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 a stronger voice. This could be an edge over China and any other country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pavan. Really appreciate those uh, very rich uh, comments covering a whole range of issues that are in the book. Uh, we have some time for questions, and uh, I see Haridas has put one already in the chat box. Would you like to, to voice that yourself, or shall, we just, shall I just read it out for you? Well, I appreciate it. Uh, if you could just read it out, uh, no worries. Thanks. Sure. So the comment is that since Japan was a driving force in pushing for the quadrilateral, which in case anyone's not familiar with this term, the quadrilateral security dialogue was something launched in the late 2000s between Japan, the United States, India, and Australia as a, as a potential new architecture for security uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. And given that the uh, Liberal Democratic Party, the incumbent party that Abe and, and the current PM Suga are from, have tried to revise the pacifist clause in Japan's constitution, Article 9, to allow a more normal range of military activity, does the idea of Japan as a courteous power uh, uh, presented in a more benign light than it in effect is? Um, I'm happy to share a couple quick comments on this, and Kyo and Pavan may have more. I think it's important to distinguish between what, uh, what Shinzo Abe tried to do and, and what Japan's behavior has actually been in practice. There's no question that if the quadrilateral had come to its full fruition, we'd be looking at a different scenario right now in the Indo-Pacific. And certainly if he had been successful in revising Article 9 uh, and, and Japan had, uh, had taken on more of a sort of a normal military role in the region, uh, uh, brandishing all of its capabilities, uh, then yes, that would lead away from what we're describing as a tradition of being a courteous power in the region. Instead, what we see are a lot of continuing constraints on Japan. In particular, Abe was unsuccessful, as Suga almost certainly will be, in revising Article 9, because they govern in coalition with Komeito, a Buddhist party that opposes a revision of Article 9. There still is a lot of popular ambivalence. In order to revise Article 9, you need to have a majority in the diet. You need to have a popular referendum. It's a very tough, tough set of hurdles to clear. And therefore, Japan has, has reverted to more of its approach that, that aligns with the, the idea of a courteous power. But I do not deny that there are that there are uh, nationalist voices in Tokyo that would like to see a less courteous approach, at least on the security front, a more confrontational approach toward China. Um, and I'll see if Kyo or Pavin would like to, to comment on this as well. No, okay. And why don't I ask the next question then? But I'm uh, muted. Sorry, I was just Sorry. muted. Um, so okay. I, I, I just wrote an op-ed on the quad. So I, I have a few things to say about this. Um, I mean, John is ex exactly right. Um, Abe, um, his really lifelong goal really was to change the revised constitution. But you know, he, he, it seemed like he came close to being in a position to doing that. But but um, the public, Japanese public, uh, you know, had had. Um, uh, wasn't really willing to move at all. Um, so if you look at the public opinion poll, it's just nowhere near uh, majority. Um, so I don't see that changing under Suga. You know, who knows, five, 10 years down the line with China becoming more aggressive, maybe that, that's a possibility. Um, but at this moment, I don't think Japan is moving quickly in that direction at all. Um, the quad um, is also somewhat overrated, I have to say, at this moment. It, it, has, a, it has great potential. But it's overrated, I think. Um, so it emerged in, uh, or it emerged in 2004 as the reaction to the Indonesian tsunami. Um, you know, there was a coalition of four countries trying to do something about it. And then in 2007, Abe elevated that into more of a, a regular working group meeting and some maritime exercises. But quickly, China came to Australia 
and uh, pressure the, the new regime, Kevin Rudd, to break away from it. So it ended quickly in 2008. Um, and it got revived in 2017, and especially you know, with Trump coming to power, it seemed useful for the US administration. And, and you know, we saw a lot in October and, and November activities around Quad. There was a meeting uh, of foreign ministers and prime ministers in, in um, um, October. And there was a first uh, uh, maritime exercise with all four navies participating a couple of weeks ago in November. Um, so now we're kind of um, getting somewhat excited about it, but it's really far from becoming institutionalized into something tangible. So we have no idea where it might go. Uh, I think a lot of the Japanese um, bureaucrats, uh, especially in MOFAR or, or DOD, not DOD, the uh, Defense uh, uh, Ministry, um, are putting their, uh, laying their eggs in that basket. Uh, and it does have potential, I think. Uh, but for it to be successful, it has to become more of an institution, institutionalized alliance. Um, and even the Japanese government is somewhat hesitant to pushing it too far uh, uh, for fear that it might alienate the Chinese government. And could, could for, for Japan, economic relations with China are quite important as well. So there is a balance to be struck and, and the Suga administration is very careful about that. Um, so it, 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 I think it will be a while before it becomes something, uh, I mean, who knows what Biden administration right, would, would like to do on that. Um, but so, and, and even if it becomes more powerful, it still needs, I think this is uh, what Pavin mentioned, the Quad really needs to become Quad Plus, with Southeast Asian countries included. South Korea is an obvious partner, right? Uh, but Japan-South Korea relationship is so bad that it's, it, it seems very difficult to do that. Uh, New Zealand, you know, so all these other countries should join in if China's threat becomes likely, right? It's likely China, the threat becomes uh, even more and more. Um, then the Quad or Quad Plus would become a very viable um, sort of source of uh, um, a counter move against China. Um, I mean, I have a, other comments on other issues, but I just want to say something about the Quad. Pavin? Well, just, just a short intervention then. Uh, well, we also have to think about that this could become uh, repetitive, you know, because if you look at the framework of ASEAN, you already have ASEAN Regional Forum. You really want to talk about security cooperation then? We already have this. And the ASEAN Regional Forum already uh, linked, you know, all key partner in Quad, you know, Japan, you know, India, and Australia. Not to mention that we also have East Asia Summit. So I think in the mind of Southeast Asia, why do we need another one? Given the fact that ASEAN has always be, been keen, you know, to, to be at the at the center of the of the entire region. Yeah, it was pretty so just quickly. That's exactly. Oh, so just quickly, that, that's exactly the problem is, is with ASEAN-based framework, right? The 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 collective decision making process of ASEAN makes it very difficult, and the quant, at least in just it looks different, right? So it, it doesn't come from ASEAN. That's why you know possibly ASEAN countries can participate one by one. Yeah, and the, and the Quad was a pretty clear effort by uh, the U.S. and Japanese governments uh, in particular to try to recruit countries along China's periphery to take sides in a strategic sense in that, in that equation, and ASEAN members don't want to do that. And so to Harita's second question about whether Japan would look, look toward a trilateral cooperation framework with India and Australia if the United States looks like it's ambivalent about a security commitment to Southeast Asia, I think that's unlikely for two reasons. I think number one, as Pavin mentioned earlier, uh, both the Australian and Indian, govern Indian governments are ambivalent about the idea of, of the Quad or a reduced version of it uh, for reasons somewhat similar to those uh, that, that, uh, that makes uh, Southeast Asian governments uh, lean against it. But secondly, uh, Japan is, although again, there are some nationalists in Japan that would like to see greater autonomy from the United States in defense affairs, that's a long-term proposition uh, uh, for Japan. Uh, the short-term consequences of a, of a clear decoupling from the United States in terms of Southeast Asian security is a non-starter in, in Tokyo defense circles. And so for both reasons, I would expect that if the United States uh, if the United States is not very active in Southeast Asian security, uh, that Japan's first phone call will be to Washington to try to get them more involved and perhaps to also uh, try to uh, encourage other Quad members to make similar phone calls to Washington, but not to try to set up a structure that's independent of the U.S.-Japan alliance.
and I'm happy if you know others may have comments as well. Uh, Kio or Pavin, did you have comments on this question? Well, what what is the question? Oh, sorry, well, a second the question there in the chat: uh, uh, whether whether if the Biden administration was ambivalent about uh, its commitment to Southeast a to East Asian security, would Japan push for a trilateral architecture involving Australia and India? Oh, okay. I mean, I think there's something right already in place. Oh, I'm not going to repeat that point, but I think Aitan has a question. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to Eitan's, uh, and I'll just read it. How is it Japan's approach to investment and economic reform in ASEAN countries involving in, evolving in the face of increased Chinese investment and influence? Uh, Eitan mentions the uh, Indonesian's uh, sweeping uh, and controversial job creation law that, that de uh, deregulates uh, uh, certain industries to attract more FDI. He notes the labor and environmental protests, uh, and a lot of Indonesians think that that law was passed under Chinese pressure. Uh, but it might also facilitate more Japanese investment. Uh, so tell us about how Japan's trying to counter uh, Chinese economic investment and whether Japan's promoting its own preferred reform policies in Southeast Asia. Pavan, I know that you had some thoughts about this in connection with uh, high-speed rail and other big investment projects. Maybe you could comment a little bit on this and, and, and Kyo and I may have comments to follow. Well, uh... Yeah, I mean, if there's a competition between, it could be two layers. Yeah. Japan want to want to maintain what has been regular for Japan, meaning that long term investment. You know, if you think about uh, automobile industry in Thailand, yeah, in Indonesia, for example, right? I think. I think Japan continue to maintain that level of investment. So uh, I think for this point, that's why it become, as I said, compensated with how Japan think about political situation in this country, because, of, because this has become long-term investment. So no matter what happened in, in the political domain, Japan seem not to be so concerned too much. The other one, I think Japan tend to pick on mega project in Southeast Asia. I, I think that when it comes to, uh, to contest with, uh, with China, uh, we're talking about high-speed uh, rail train. But I think on this, China has, might have an edge over, uh, over Japan because of the connectivity, uh, connectedness between, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about phys physical connectivity of China and Southeast Asia. Uh, you, know, you, you can't deny the fact that uh, the dream of linking the South of China you know, to uh, the end of the, the Strait of Malacca you know, in Singapore, it has has long always had always been a dream, and I think it's become a reality. It's, it might have already become a reality there, and I think that is something that uh, Japan uh, find it difficult to compete with. Uh, the other thing also, this is something that I'm interested, in, but I I don't know yet. It's a kind of uh, contract farming. This is something is very new in in Southeast Asia when China uh, have a kind of direct investment with particular particular businesses and in this in this case is a farming business you know and in particular in the least developed nation of southeast asia lao cambodia and vietnam in particular that you also started to see japan coming in as well so uh yeah this is just my intervention thank you kyo did you want to share on this topic yeah, so I, we, John and I just had a chance to talk to some experts in Thailand. Um, and we, we, there was a very interesting comment about how Thai elites, a lot of Thai elites have um, sort of um, Chinese heritage root. And one uh, scholar, uh, I was kind of surprised, publicly talked about how um, he just enjoys China's success and he wants to see more of that. And when it comes to investment in Thailand as well, a lot of elites in Thai who, with Chinese uh, connections, ethnic identification um, would prefer uh, connecting with China. So Japan has to contend with that. So being courteous and popular in popular culture and that kind of stuff is nice. 
but but that's that's a <laughs> it's a tough competition in that regard. So um, I, I mean I'm not suggesting that that's the only reason why Japan has lost in the competition and all that. Uh, but but I, I'm wondering if there's a to what extent that's true. Maybe Pavin can comment on this because I was really struck by the comment and but that's one person's evaluation, so I'm not sure. Um, and also, I, I should say that Kiri's chapter talks about this a little bit and how Japan realizing that uh, the winning, the, you know, the, the the bidding for high speed uh, trains and stuff like that, it, it, you know, they kept Japan kept losing and losing, and it's kind of hard. So now they're shifting the attention to smaller projects like subways in cities that are slightly right smaller, um, and and Japan is having more success in that regard. And that may be where being courteous uh, uh, is paying off because uh, you know Thai government might go to um, China for the big big investments, but you know it still has some sense that it needs to be nice to China, Japan as well. So some smaller projects it would go to Japan, and Japan is actually pretty good at that. Those kinds of right city buses or subway system, Japan is very good at that too. Um, so so that that's where kind of things might be shifting, uh, which is a you know it's a consolation price. Right, but it's not a bad consolation prize. Well, I'm, um, I have a comment too, but Pavi, maybe you could share a little bit about the ethnic Chinese factor in investment. Yeah, uh, first thing first, I was, I mean, I had a talk with uh, the government official when it come to the high speed train. They just basically confessed that Japan is more expensive and China offer uh, a friendship prize. <laughs> a friendship prize, we have, we have heard this decades ago, Naomi, I mean, originally they talk about military hardware from China at a friendship price. Now we talk about high speed rail from China at a friendship price comparing with uh, Japan too. But yeah, the ethnic Chinese among the Thai elites, I think this, this is that person really spot on. And this is something that I'm interested in as well. Uh, that's two things. One is that the majority of Thai prime minister they are half Thai, half Chinese. That go to show how significant, you know, China rank in, in the Thai political thinking, political idea, right? And don't forget that, I mean, the Chinese uh, in Thailand, uh, they, they, they well assimilated into Thai society. Uh, I am a product of, you know, Thai Chinese uh, thing, right? Uh, businesses, big businesses also dominated by this Thai Chinese group. Right, the biggest one is Jalan Pokapan. Jalan Pokapan basically now dominate, dominates almost everything in Thailand from large, large, large businesses into something really small. Right now, 7 Eleven, the convenience store, now being taken over by Jalan Pokapan. Jalan Pokapan know the Chinese leadership right in the, in the com uh, com Communist Party. So that's why. You know, you, you start to see the link at the top level, not just political leadership, but also the economic uh, leadership as well. Uh, and Jalan Pokopan not only big in terms of economic investment within Thailand and its, its connection with the Chinese leadership, it's also involved so much into the, uh, in the business with the Thai monarchy too. That, that when the Thai monarchy start to play a role here. You know, uh, in, in the past week, the Thai protester protested against uh, the, 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 the super rich status of the king, the crop property bureau, how the crop property bureau has dominated the Thai economy, working hand in hand with the Thai Chinese uh, business community, like Jalan Pokapan, like, uh, like Bia Chang, you know, like Singha Bia, like Sim, uh, Thai Siam Cement Company. These are big, big, big company, once again dominated by Thai Chinese and also the monarchy. Last year, about the monarchy, and then with China and Japan. Uh, we have seen the, uh, a very intimate relationship between the Thai royal family with the Chinese leadership for a long, long time now. Uh, I mean, Thai royal families, they are really, I mean, they are really popular in China. With Japan, there's some interruption in, in this kind of relationship between monarchy business and Japan too. Uh, it's happened that the current king you know, made a scene when he came to Japan in the 1980s as a crown prince. And then there was a big argument with the, with the Japanese horse. I did write about it. You know, you can find out a bit later. Uh, this thing is not small, but because good relationship at the top level, not only can pave the way for political uh, cooperation, but also in business like this, that would come in, bring in Thai Chinese 
uh, mix investor you know to play a role here. I have a quick comment on the latter part of your question, Eitan, about the regulatory vision that Japan has for, for investment in the region. First of all, Japan is still, the stock of Japanese investment is still larger by a sizable margin than the Chinese stock of FDI in Southeast Asia. And so Japan has some legacy advantage in relationships in certain countries and certain domains, uh, less so perhaps in the mainland than in the maritime states. But there's also the quality infrastructure investment initiative where Japan basically laid out in broad brush terms what its answer is to your question, which is that we want to provide big ticket investment that meets higher labor and environmental standards. And if you select our project, you're not going to have mass protests in the streets. You're not going to have roads crumbling in a few years. I'm not suggesting that all Chinese projects are, are, uh, are shoddy construction or that they violate these, these rules, but clearly Japan was trying to present a contrast. And the thing I think that matters about this is twofold. One is that if a country actually, if a government actually wants to take the more expensive project that has higher labor and environmental standards, Japan is there and is ready to, is to do that deal. Secondly, if Japan doesn't get the bid, it still puts the country that's bargaining for the contract in a better negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis China because there's another bidder. And so it may be that the, the quality of Chinese projects goes up because there's actually some serious competition from Japanese bidders. That would be a real benefit to Southeast Asia. And that may be an indirect mechanism whereby Japan gets some of what, it, of, 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 of what it's advertised as its regulatory agenda in the region, understanding that for a variety of reasons, it's gonna lose a lot of the bids. So do any others have, have questions? We have time for one or two more quick ones if you yes, want to share. I think that's a question uh, for me. Uh, question, for, the, question. For, the, for the Thai protest. Um, oh. So I think for me, is that as I'm learning from all this discussion, there seems to be a pattern. My experience of dealing with uh, learning about Japan is really Japan's taking a lot of soft approaches in terms of exerting oh. itself politically, economically, and, uh, and, and socially in terms of uh, making very clear that they're supporting other uh, countries for aid or, or for multilateral uh, actions uh, or informal influence from the culture that has um, been exported out of Japan. And so just one situation that I, I wanted to kind of uh, hear your thoughts about has been that the current Thai protests um, happening uh, and challenging the political status quo of the monarchy in Thailand. And do you see Japan taking a different stance in this situation or just more of the repeat of what they've already kind of taken in the past regarding these? This is a very thin line where Japan's trying to be, we support certain democratic values, but we also want to keep these relationships open um, as well. Uh, because in these particular protests, there's also an element of culture as well from what I've been reading is that there's been uh, uh, some um, cultural impacts from, from Japan and where the students have been using to, to, to promote this pro-democratic uh, pro movement in Thailand. Hey, uh, before Pavin responds to that, maybe we'll take Pisacha's question too, and then, and then we can just have a quick round of, of, uh, of closing comments. You're muted. It looks like your your audio is not working, but you've done us the favor of typing it in can, the chat. So I'll read can it from unmute. the chat. Wait, can you hear me? Oh, now yeah, you're good. Yes, yes. Now you're good. Okay, sorry. Um, so as you can tell by my name, I'm Thai American. And um, thank you so much, Ajahn Win, for being here. And I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I'm curious to hear to what extent is Southeast Asian countries are falling under China's uh, debt trap um, di di diplomacy, where China being a powerful lender seeks to exert its power over its borrower through the enormous debt. Thank you. Okay, so great. Um, Pavin, maybe you wanted to offer a few thoughts on those two questions and then Kia, if you have any little closing remarks, that's great. Oh, I'll be quick. Uh, thank you so much for the first question. I think Japan has been very pragmatic you know, in the, in the current situation in Thailand. A uh, pragmatic in a sense that uh, not, necessary, not necessarily jumping into, uh, into taking any sides in the Thai political divide. I think Japan watched the situation quite carefully. Uh, this is also because we are talking about a 
the same sort of constitutional monarchy. What will happen in Thailand? You also can can learn a lesson from Japan too, as a successful constitutional monarchy. You know, but behind the scene, I'm sure that a lot of Japanese scholar and also those in the government would be laughing at the Thai king right now for not knowing that it's time for the reform. You just you still have to go with the reform. But I guess uh, because of the of the as I said, the economic interest because of the need to compete with China, you know, uh, to that high level. Japan has continued to, to be very careful, which again for the Thai protester it, it, it's a little bit of a disappointing because Japan could exert more power using its economic uh, influence, but I don't think Japan want to do it. But I can understand. I can understand though because because it is too soon to say who would who would come out as a winner in this in this Thai you know uh, political turmoil. You know, choosing the wrong side you know would cause a lot of uh, national interest, you know. Okay, the other one is the, uh, uh, yes, of course. I mean, it's very difficult for for especially the least developed country, as I mentioned before, uh, that has fallen into a uh, debt trap. You know, uh, diplomacy. I'm thinking about uh, Laos and Cambodia uh, and Myanmar. I think uh, with with the United States seeming to you know to to fade away during the Trump, and we're not sure it, uh, also during Biden that, that the United States will return to Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has no rank high in the US foreign policy anyway. And then because of that, the hope is for Japan to come and, 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 and make it more balanced. But right now, I don't think Japan has been able to do so because I think the influence of, of China has been too immense. I just want to give you one last uh, example of what really happened you know, with Cambodia. If you remember, I think in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, with the, the South China Sea issue, and then with uh, Cambodia be, uh, serve, serving as uh, the, uh, the chairman of the ASEAN uh, committee, uh, and then we, we would not be able to produce uh, the, the joint communique at the end because uh, obviously, uh, Cambodia care too much about the uh, uh, to upset you know, the the Chinese leadership. So I guess that here to answer your question, Japan has a role to play, at least you know to make things more balanced uh, among these least developing country. Thank you, Pavan. Kyo, any any final uh, thoughts as we wind um, up? Yeah, just quickly, I I I think the. Um, all the constraints or forces that put Japan into a, becoming a courteous power. Um, I mean, I, I want to give some agency to, to Japanese policymakers, but for the most part, it was a lot, there were a lot of constraints that put Japan in, in the position. And most of them are kind of still there. Uh, the legacy of World War II, people still talk about it. And as you know, there's always this suspicion about somebody like Abe being a hawkish nationalist who's intent on you know, rebuild the military and expanding and, you know, which is, um, I, I don't agree with that assessment, but there's, that suspicion is still there. So that, that, you know, Japan cannot escape that very quickly, even after 70 plus years. So that's there. And the constitutional, right, constraint, Article 9 is there, unlikely to change anytime soon. So Japan cannot really engage in, uh, I mean, it, the, the Japan's military capacity is expanding and legal constraints are becoming somewhat looser than before, but still, it, you know, it's, it, it cannot really engage in the same kind of activities that the United States can or China can. So that's still there. Um, and ASEAN's collective decision-making procedure is still there. So, you know, all, all of those things that have not changed that, much, that dramatically so that uh, I can't, I don't imagine Japan's courtesy approach getting uh, dropped uh, in the next few years or so. Uh, I think Japan will stay that way. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't know about, there are some ambitious politicians who want Japan to play bigger roles, right? That's true. But um, I think for the most part, the Japanese public is quite content being a trusted partner in the region, being a popular country, looking at the uh, public opinion survey and seeing that Japan is very popular in many countries. They're quite happy with that. And they don't really wanna try to compete with China full on. Uh, and, and overtake China in the region to become the most powerful nation in the region. I don't, I don't see a lot of Japanese public wanting that. So, so I think for the foreseeable future, um, Japan's approach will uh, kind of stay constant unless there's a dramatic shift in the way China engages with the region or with Japan, with Senkaku and so on. That might trigger 
Japan into a very different direction. But otherwise, I think Japan will stay being a courteous power. All right, excellent uh, wrap up uh, comment then for our discussion. Thank you to Pavin for joining us from Kyoto and, and your insights. Uh, thanks to Erica uh, for organizing. Thanks to all of you for coming, especially uh, for many of you late in your evening. So thanks a lot. We'll look forward to continuing the conversation another time and uh, have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pavin. Very helpful. Thank you, Hio. Thank you. Thank Learned you so a lot. Much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions from the audience. Yes.